Hey folks, welcome to Christian Baptist Church. If this is your first time uh, joining us here this morning, uh, we're thrilled that you've come to join us. Um, there are some visitors with us both on Zoom this morning, but also on Facebook Live. And so for those of you uh, who are on Facebook Live, a warm welcome to you as well. Uh, and we're really glad that, uh, that you've joined us this morning uh, for our Zoom church. Um, there's a verse in the Bible that says, this is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. You know, it's really easy for us to look outside and we see beautiful sunshine today. And I actually went for a little bit of a walk outside this morning before the service. Um, and and the, the air was fresh. Uh, it was just a beautiful, crisp morning this morning. On days like this, it's really easy to rejoice. On days like this, it's easy to celebrate and to be glad. It's not so easy to do that when bad news comes and when the events of the world seem to weigh us down or when we've got uh, family issues or health issues. Um, all of these things tend to get in the way of us rejoicing, but rejoicing is a choice. And uh, today, um, I want to invite you uh, encourage you uh, to do just that, to make a choice to rejoice. I actually didn't mean that to rhyme, but the point's still there. Um, choose today to do that. Choose today. Uh, it's a great way to start a day normally, but it's also good for our health. And this morning, as we're going into um, our service this morning, uh, we're going to be addressing the issue of fear again. Uh, being free from fear. And I think that God wants us to be free from fear. Uh, and so I'm excited about the, the message that I think God's put on my heart for us all today. Um, uh, for those of you who are following along with the scripture passages, but may not have your Bible with you or something to write the passages down, uh, Danny's taken the liberty of taking the Bible verses that we're going to be looking at today and has posted them on our Facebook page so you can go and take a look at them afterwards. And if you would like them uh, emailed to you, we can send that to you also by email. Uh, let's join uh, together with a word of prayer as we begin our morning together. Father, thank you so much for this beautiful day that we see outside. Thank you for the sun that comes and the reminder that uh, it won't be long and spring will be here uh, again. Lord, there are a lot of things that are weighing us down this week. There's health situations. There's uh, financial situations. There's the concern for world events and the things that we hear in the news. There's family problems that weigh us down. But Lord, in all of these things, you have come to bring us life. You've come to bring us hope. Uh, and we choose to walk in those things. Oh well, God, would you meet us in our fear and our discontent and when you bring us to a place where we can be content in you and we ask that in jesus name amen stephen's gonna open up with a, a song for us I will 
We're reading today from 1 John 3, verses 1 to 3. How great is the love the Father has lavished on us that we should be called children of God. And that, and that is what we are. The reason the world does not know us is that it did not know him. Dear friends, now we are children of God, and what we will be has not yet been made known. But we know that when he appears, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. Everyone who has this hope in him purifies himself, just as he is pure. Thank you, Judy. Good morning. Would you pray with me, please? Oh, God. You are the one we bow down to as Moses at the burning bush. We worship you. We bow with you as you stood before Pharaoh through Moses. And you asked him to tell Moses to set the people free. Lord, we are seeking for freedom, the freedom that comes only from you. Thank you for when you used another shepherd, David to stand before Goliath. Lord, we each have Goliaths in our own lives. We pray that we might stand with you in your freedom because you have called us. And we thank you for the disciples who saw the majesty and power and authority of Jesus in the boat on the way to the Ten Towns. Thank you that you were the one who settled the storm. You called peace and the waves became calm. So we look to you to do this in our lives today, in this coming week. Thank you that all power and authority is given to you, Jesus. So we look to you to worship you today and to see you active in our midst. We pray in your name. Amen. 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 Thank you, George. Thank you, Judy. Appreciate that. Last Sunday, we began a discussion on freedom, uh, and we've called it, I am free. Um, 
I think that we need to focus on the truth of that for us today, that in Jesus, the Bible says that we are free. So last week, we focused specifically on being free from fear. But what struck me amazing was the number of people that called me and spoke to me literally from Sunday afternoon forward uh, and talked to me about the struggle that they have with different areas of their life um, where they're afraid, they have fear. And I had to be brutally honest with me. There are still many areas of my life that I can get trapped up in when it comes to fear. So I want to address that a little bit more this morning and talk about us being free from fear. Because as we've gone through this past week, the news hasn't gotten better. As we've gone through this past week, our struggles haven't changed the circumstances around us. But the good news is neither has God. And the one who has said to us that we do not need to be afraid is still here for us. And he is on our side. So this week, as we prepare to come to the communion table with our bread and something to drink, uh, we want to remember what Jesus has done for us on the cross. And I think we should look deeper into God's word and see what he has to say to us specifically about fear. One of the things that we focused on last week was that not all fear is bad. In fact, the fear of God is good. It turns us to righteousness. And we learned that if we want to be free from our fears, free from the troubles of this world, then what we really needed to do was to focus specifically on God and see him as holy. We need to see him as the one to be feared but not afraid of. We need to see him as being feared, in other words, honored and respected because of his awesome power and his great authority. But if we're followers of Jesus, we do not need to be afraid of him. In fact, the Bible even instructs us to fear God above everything else. That's what we looked at last week, to fear God above the storm, above the disease, above the pandemic above the news and the restrictions, above the job and the financial struggles, above the lockdowns and the lies of the media on whatever side we hear, beyond the political agendas. Do not be afraid of those who can kill the body but cannot kill the soul. Rather be afraid of the one who can destroy the body, who can destroy both the soul and the body in hell is what the scripture we read last week. So last week, we discovered some really good news. There are tremendous benefits from fearing God above everything else. Remember, we read that the angel of the Lord accounts, uh, encamps around those who fear the Lord, and he protects them. Those who fear the Lord lack for nothing, and salvation is near them. We discovered that God pours out his love and compassion on those who fear the Lord and that he does it in abundance. And we saw that God gives wisdom on how to live life to the fullest, and he fulfills the desires of our hearts. He protects us. He was our secure fortress. He's our refuge for us and for our children. And those who fear the Lord are led into new life, a better life, and he gives them wealth and honor and fullness. Yes, those who fear the Lord continually receive his mercy. And as if there could be any more, he also calls us his child, his bride, and his friend. So the first thing that we have to focus on is this, is that we need to fear God alone. Not our circumstance, not the events, not the fearfulness of the things that people want to press on us. We need to fear God alone. So it begs a question here. Have you ever evaluated your fear? Work with me here for just a moment. Why is it that we're afraid? Why is it that I have fear? 
So let's go back just briefly to the same passage that we looked at from last week. Turn in your Bible to Matthew chapter 8. Matthew chapter 8, first book of the New Testament, and verse 26. So Jesus asked his disciples to evaluate their faith. He said those exact words. He said, why are you afraid? Why? It's important for us to ask that same question. You see, I think Jesus wants us to understand our fear, to evaluate our fear, to discern if it's a warning from God or if it's a threat from the enemy. Because you see, how we deal with our fear is a lot to do with understanding where it's coming from. See, God never makes threats. But he does give his people warnings. Throughout the Old Testament, prophets like Isaiah and Jeremiah, Samuel, Elijah, and Elisha, they would speak the word of God to the people of Israel, often to the kings, on behalf of God. They would get a message from God and warn the king about uh, what they were doing and how they needed to live. And then when they turned their heart back to God, God would bless them. God gave his people warnings, and warnings are a good thing because they keep us going in the right direction. So, listen, one of the best ways for us to overcome our fear is to learn to discern or evaluate, identify the difference between a warning from God and a threat from the enemy, Satan. The problem that we face is that sometimes they can seem like the same thing on the surface. So here's another question. Is the sense of fear that I'm experiencing a warning from God, um, a warning that I'm about to do something stupid, something wrong, or is it a threat from the enemy trying to keep me from doing something that God wants me to do that's good? You see the difference between those two things? The enemy wants, us, wants to keep us from following and obeying God. God wants us to come closer to him. So a warning from God is always rooted in truth. A threat from the enemy, on the other hand, it's embedded in lies. We need to ask ourselves, is this fear that we're facing, does it line up with the word of God? Or does it just give us this vague sense of something's wrong, something's not in our control? The second thing is, a warning from God revolves around what will happen. If we disobey God, this is the consequence. But if we obey him, this is the benefit. But a threat from the enemy, it revolves around what might happen. You know, the what ifs of life. Now, a warning from God motivates us and gives us a push in the right direction, but a threat from the enemy paralyzes us with indecision. A warning from God is specific. God doesn't play around. He teaches and leads us in the way that we should go. He leads us in paths of righteousness for his namesake. Did you catch that? Turn quickly in your Bible to Psalm 23, a psalm that we all know. But there's a verse and, and an emphasis that I want you to grab hold of in this passage. Psalm 23, verse 3. It says this, he renews my life. He leads me along right paths for his name's sake. He leads us along the right path because his name, his reputation depend on it. But a threat from the enemy just leaves us with nagging doubt. Listen, this is one of the keys because Satan loves to hammer us with this. We sin, we ask God to forgive us. Then we sin again, we get angry with ourselves, and we promise God, I'll never ever do that again. And then we sin again, and again. And then we hear the voice of the enemy. The enemy says, now you've blown it. Now you've gone too far. You've gone beyond God's grace. God could never forgive you. 
you're in trouble this time. God's tired of your failure. He's tired of your brokenness. There's no more room at the cross for you. Do you ever feel like that? Because I have. But here's the good news. That is not the voice of God. A threat from the enemy is just that. It's cheap. It's a vague lie. It makes its bed in doubt and it refuses to acknowledge the word of the God, uh, the word of God. But God has said, I have loved you with an everlasting love. Isn't that great news? See, a warning from God is a pathway to protection. While a threat from the enemy, it's a highway to hell. And it's designed to keep us in the pit of despair. Listen to what I'm saying here. When we pay attention to God's warnings, we do not need to be afraid. We do not need to cope with the threats of the enemy. In fact, we can stand over them because we have the word of God. Now, if we want to find freedom from fear, we must first fear God more than the storm. But the second thing we have to do is we need to evaluate our fear and know where it's coming from, whether it's coming from God or the enemy. So there's another thing that we can do. We can attack our fear with the word of God. So take your Bible, turn over to the Gospel of John, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, the fourth book in the New Testament, and chapter 8. John chapter 8, verses 31 and 32. This is the word of Jesus. Jesus said, if you hold on to my teaching, then you're my disciples. Then you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. I don't know about you, but I want to be free. If I want to be free, then I need to know God's word. If I want to know God's word, the best way to do that is to commit it to my heart, to read it regularly, and to commit it even to my memory. Let me give you a few examples of what I mean here. Have you ever wondered if you ever mattered to God? Ephesians 2.10 says this, for we are God's handiwork, his masterpiece, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. Have you ever felt like you've gone too far, that you've sinned beyond the reach of God's grace, that he's given up on you? Take a look at Romans chapter 8, verse 1. It says this, it says, therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. And 1 John 1, 9 says, if we confess our sins, in other words, if we agree with God on our sin, this is what our sin is, God, then he is faithful and just to forgive our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. Have you ever been afraid and felt hopeless? Fear that um, we need to attack the fear with the word of God. 2 Corinthians 12, 9 says these words. It says, but God says to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I boast all the more gladly about my weakness so that Christ's power may rest in me. Have you been afraid to suffer? Attack the fear with the truth of Romans 8, 18, which says... I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing to the glory that will be revealed in us. Are you afraid of the future and what might happen with this crazy world and the world events? Then we need to attack that fear with the word of God. So take your Bible, Old Testament again, Jeremiah 29, 11. I know most of you know this verse by heart, but I want you to take a look at it. Jeremiah 29 and verse 11. The prophet said this to the people. He said, for, and, and it was using God's words specifically, for I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you a hope and a future. 
God is for us. He has a plan for us. He has a desire for us. And if you're finding yourself tripped up, wallowed up, um, uh, almost stuck in this quicksand of despair, it is the enemy. It is Satan who wants to drag you down. God has a plan for you. He has a plan for me. He has a plan for us, church, right here on Main Street. And what does Romans 8, 28 say? We know this verse. We've heard it so many times over this last year. And we know that God causes everything to work together for the good of those who love God and are called according to his purpose. Are you afraid to die? Attack the fear of death with the truth of God's word. 1 Corinthians 15, 54 to 57 says, When our dying bodies have been transformed into bodies that will never die, the scripture will be fulfilled. Death is swallowed up in victory. Oh, death, where is your victory? Oh, death, where is your sting? The sin, the sin is, sorry, for sin is the sting that results in death. And the law gives sin its power, but thank God, he gives us victory over sin and death through the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's what we celebrate today at communion. And if that's not enough for us, look at what it says in 2 Corinthians 5, 8. It says, to be away from the body is to be at home with the Lord. Man, that's where I want to be one day, present in the Lord's presence. Please, don't just hear what I'm saying here. Listen and let it grow roots in your heart. Whatever you're afraid of, there's a truth in God's word that that you can attack it with. I don't know about you, but I am so thankful for that. To be free from fear, we need to fear God above everything else. We need to evaluate our fear and understand where it's coming from. Is it godly fear that leads to righteousness? Or is it the enemy's accusations that lead us into cowardliness and defeat? And we need to attack our fear with the word of God. We need to be armed with the word of God, not just by having the book with us at all times, but having the book in our hearts and in our minds so that when we are tripped, we know that we don't need to be afraid and we can stand again. But finally, we also need to remember that God is surrounding us and protecting us. So that brings us to where I want to focus here for just a moment. Turn in your Bibles. It's an Old Testament book, uh, the second book of Kings. So um, 2 Kings and chapter 6. Second Kings and chapter 6. So let me give you the story behind this. So in the passage of scripture, um, King Aram, who is an enemy of the people of Israel, um, an enemy of God's people, he sent an army to capture the prophet Elisha. And here's why. Every time Aram goes to attack Israel, the prophet gets a message from God, and he goes and warns the king, and the king of Israel's prepared, and Aram can't succeed. Now, if you were trying to do something and trying to get advantage over somebody, and you had a plan to do that, wouldn't it be nasty if God kept telling your your enemy what your plan was? Because you'd be tripped every time. You'd never make success. Well, this was what was happening to Aram. Every time Aram cooked up this plan and every time he had some scheme against Israel, God would tell Elijah what it is and Elijah would go and tell the king and the people would be saved. So Aram, God's enemy, Israel's enemy, is coming down to try to capture Israel. This time he decides, I know what I'm going to do. If I capture Elisha, then he can't go to the king of Israel and he can't tell them what my plan is. So at night, 
the king of Aram, he sends a great army with all of his chariots and horses, and he surrounds them. So in 2 Kings chapter 6, we're going to focus on um, verse 14 through 17. It says this, then Aram sent horses and chariots and a strong force there. They went by night and surrounded the city. And when the servant of the man of God got up and went out at early the next morning, an army with horses and chariots had surrounded the city. Oh no, my Lord, what shall we do? The servant said to Elisha. Do not be afraid, the prophet answered. Those who are with us are more than those who are with them. Stop for just a second. The servant didn't see anything other than the army that was around him. All he saw around him was Aram's army. All he could see with his physical eyes was that Aram's army was big and they were against him. If all you can see is your problem that's around you and you focus on the problem that's around you, it can be terrifying. Listen, I'm not trying to minimize the fear or the events of the world around us. If all we do is look at the people that have died of COVID, we could be afraid. If all we do is listen to the news reports of the problems that are facing us right now, we could be afraid. If all we do is hear the stories and we tune our ears to how many more days, weeks, or months we're going to have to wear a mask or not visit face-to-face, -face, we can be afraid. It's true because the circumstances look bad. Okay, back to the scripture. So Elisha prayed, open his eyes, Lord, so that he may see. Elijah prayed for his servant. He said, God, open the eyes of your servant so that he can see that you're already at work. He wanted him to see that God was already doing something, that God had already made a plan. So then the scripture continues. It says, then the Lord opened the servant's eyes and he looked and he saw the hills full of horses and chariots of fire all around Elisha. Isn't that amazing? What he saw originally was Aram's army. And he was scared because Aram's army was a fearful foe. But when God opened his eyes, he saw beyond the enemy to see what God was doing. And I think this is what God is calling us to do. He's calling us to live in faith beyond the physical thing that we see and to trust his word. And the only way we can see God is if we have our book and we own it. Look, it's not good enough to have this Bible sitting on a shelf and never read and never committed to our hearts. We need to know the word and we need to know all of the counsel of God in the word of God. Not just parts of it, not just the parts that we like. The whole thing. You see, God was already at work. He had already surrounded Aram's army. Sure, Aram's army was huge, but the angel armies of the living God are way bigger than yours and my problem. Did you hear that? The God of the angel armies is bigger and greater than any struggle we could be going through right now. Just because we can't see the problem, just because we can't, or sorry, just because we can't see the deliverer right now, just because we can't feel that he is close and nearby, his word promises and it has never failed. I think it's interesting that I think when Elijah prayed, I think that he prayed so that his servant could hear him. I think he prayed out loud. And I think he did that so that he could see that this wasn't something that was, that he wasn't praying and, and then all of the army showed up as a response to prayer. I, I think it was important because the servant needed to know that God was already at work even before Elijah prayed. Elisha. The servant couldn't see them but God was already at work. 
And listen, just because you can't see God at work right now doesn't mean he's not at work. He is. He is for you and for me. And he is not against us. Whatever fear is surrounding you today, God is surrounding that fear. He is bigger. He is able to conquer it. Listen to Psalm 125 verses 1 and 2. In fact, don't listen to it. I want you to read it. If you've got your Bibles with you, turn to Psalm 125. This is such a beautiful passage of scripture. I never understood the significance of it as much as I understood it this past week as I reread it. And that's what I love about the Bible is it's fresh when we read it every day. We can get more and more and more out of it. Psalm 125 verses 1 and 2. Those who trust in the Lord are like Mount Zion, which cannot be removed or shaken. It endures forever. As the mountains surround Jerusalem, so the Lord surrounds his people, both now and forevermore. Let me read that again to you. Those who trust in the Lord, where is your trust? Those who trust in the Lord are like Mount Zion, which cannot be removed and cannot be shaken. It endures forever. As the mountains surround Jerusalem, so the Lord surrounds his people, both now and forevermore. If there's a good place for an a, a yay God, that is the place. God surrounds his people with victory. 1 John 4, 4 says, the one who is in you is greater than the one that is in the world. I love Danny's picture when you see it up there. And he's got this lion over top of his shoulder, this roaring lion of Aslan. I, I picture that when I see this. The one who is inside of me is greater than everyone that could be around me. It's like, I got your back. And just like Aslan in... Um, uh, now I've forgotten the name of the uh, Chronicles of Narnia. Just as, as Aslan was for those children, God is for us. And he is greater than our enemy. Listen, here's great news for you and for me. If we're fear-filled because of the news stories and the world events, because of the health situations that we may personally be going through right now, because of our own loss and loneliness that we may have been suffering because of a loved one that has passed away or one that is in the hospital or a nursing home and we can't visit them. Our God is greater and he is near you. We don't have to be afraid. We don't have to fear the problems of the day because we know who we're trusting in. John 14, verse 1 says this, says Jesus' words, do not let your hearts be troubled. Trust in God. Trust also in me. And Hebrews 12, verses 5 and 6 says this, God has said, I will never leave you. I will never abandon you. So you can say with confidence, the Lord is my helper. So I will have no fear. What can mere people do to me? See, God wants you and I to be free. Do you believe that? I mean, do you really believe that today? God wants you and me to be free from fear. Listen, fear God above everything else. You don't have to be afraid. Even when something is out there that is fearful, Jesus is greater than what we fear, and he is with you. Evaluate your fear. Make sure that it's fear that is from God. Godly sorrow, godly fear leads to repentance. And if we attack our fear with God's truth, then we know that it's not something that we can be afraid of. Arm yourself with God's word. Memorize it. Yes, here I am again, the harping pastor who's telling you to memorize scripture. Listen, I wish somehow we had that 
program that we had back when I was in Sunday school that caused us to memorize scripture verses. I mean, back then it was because we'd get a package of gum or something like that. If we only knew the freedom that we can have today, if we had God's word hidden in our hearts when we face the struggles of this day. So yes, memorize it. And finally, remember what fear is surrounding you may seem big, but the God of the angel armies surrounds your fear. And according to Isaiah 54, verse 17, actually, this is another good verse to write down. Isaiah 54, verse 17, says this, no weapon that is formed against you will succeed. You will silence every voice raised up to accuse you. These benefits are enjoyed by the servants of the Lord. Their vindication will come from me. I, the Lord, have spoken it. In Jesus, you are free from fear. Let me say that again. In Jesus, you are free from fear. Look what he's done for you. Please get with me your bread and your cup that you've prepared this morning for communion. Place them in front of you. Today we remember with bread and with wine or with juice, the sacrifice, the very real sacrifice that Jesus has made for you because he loves you. First Corinthians verse 11 verses 23 to 26, the apostle Paul writes these words, and they are for you and me today. For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night that he was betrayed, he took bread, and after he had given thanks. He broke it. And he said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after dinner, he took the cup and he said to his disciples, this is my new covenant in my blood. Drink this whenever you drink it. Do it in remembrance of me. And when we come to the table, we're proclaiming his love for you and for me. His literal body, his real body died on the cross. And we remember that until he comes. So why these two elements? I think it's profound for us today. Listen to the story of the bread in Isaiah 53, verses 5, 3 to 5. It says, he was despised and rejected by mankind, a man of suffering and, and familiar with our pain. Like one whom people hid their faces, he was despised, and we held him in low esteem. Surely he took up our pain and bore our suffering, yet we considered him punished by God, stricken by him and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our sins. The punishment that brings us peace was placed on him, and by his wounds we are healed. Listen, by his stripe cancer dies. By his stripes, heart disease is cured. The leper becomes clean. The lame walks in the blind sea. He took the whips in his body. He suffered our pain, our sickness, our brokenness, and our fear. By his stripes, he gives us strength to the weary. He gives, he increases our weakness he gives us power by his stripes. Yes, look back at the stripes. Look back at the wounds that he suffered for us. Willingly, because we were helpless in our body to carry such a burden of death. 
You may feel like the burden that you're carrying right now is too much for you to carry. I have good news for you. Because of this broken bread, you can know that he has carried the sacrifice for you. It's about what Jesus has done for you. And what he's done for me that I could not do for myself. I can almost hear it now. Are you saying, Pastor Andrew, if I just eat this bread, healing can come to my body because of this bread, just because I eat this bread? Listen, don't make mistake in this. This is why the whole message of the word of God is important to us. This is why we cannot leave out one story from the word of God. Go back to the Garden of Eden. Go back to the place where it all began. Strip the garden away and you miss the entire message of the good news of Jesus. Remember when one meal with one piece, <coughs> excuse me, one piece of fruit with one selfish decision made by one couple named Adam and Eve, they chose their plan and not God's plan. Their way, not God's way. The entire fall of man, the reason we suffer today, came because of a selfish decision to eat. God puts a premium on what we eat, and he says to us today, this bread, this bread is my life for you. It's my body, my life for you. Remember me. Remember me. Let's pray. Oh God, you love me. And you displayed your love for me in Jesus. Your sacrifice, too great for us to imagine and far too great for us to bear. You took it upon yourself, our shame, our sin, our selfishness, our choice to go our way and not your way. Today, we remember afresh your body, your stripes, your suffering for us in Jesus. By your grace, Lord, we take hold of what you have done for us. And we literally eat, we internalize that to remember that in Jesus we are healed, both body and soul healed. Your broken body for us, you are the Holy One. And we stand in awe of you. And we give thanks. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. And after dinner, he took the bread and he broke it. And he gave it to his disciples and he said, take it and eat. Take and eat. Not only was Jesus' body bruised, cut, and broken for us, the Bible says that his blood was spilled for us too. His precious blood was spilled almost like um, an inkwell that we can put our finger in and sign that we belong to God. It's a new covenant that he signed on our behalf, an agreement between God and us. His shed blood spilled to wash us, the unbelievable audacity that God would shed his blood for sinners. 
to cleanse us, to wash us from all of our unrighteousness. But in the Old Testament, it spoke of this. In Leviticus 17, 11, we read these words. It says, for the life of a creature is in the blood, and I have given it to make an atonement for yourselves on the altar. It is the blood that makes atonement for one's life. And in Hebrews 9, 12, the Bible says, without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sins. Jump back to the Old Testament. The high priest, he was required to offer blood, not just for the sins of the people, but also for his own sins, but not Jesus. You see, Jesus is our meteor, mediator. He is our sinless lamb, our blameless, spotless sacrifice. He did not need to make a sacrifice for his own sins. The blood he shed was for yours and for my sin. No matter how far you and me may have fallen from God, no matter how bad our past has been, he has been calling us to look at the signed blood agreement that is in this cup. This blood takes away our sins to remember that God is on our side. Today, you and I are invited to this table to remember the blood. Jesus said, this cup is my new covenant agreement sealed in blood for you. Remember me. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, all the things we enjoy in life, our health, our friends, our family, even the beauty of the sunrise this morning on this day, they come from your hand. And today we stop to remember you. We're so thankful that the blood that you gave brought us the opportunity through faith to be cleansed, washed of our sins, to be made right with you. Your blood washes us pure like snow. You poured out your love through the shedding of blood for us. And because of your blood, we have been set free from fear. We no longer need to be afraid. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. And after dinner, Jesus took the cup and he said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Drink it in remembrance of me. Before Stephen plays our last song for today, I want to remind you of the words of Jesus. They were penned just for you. So if the Son has set you free, you are free indeed. So I want you to repeat after me, just like we did last week. In Jesus, in Jesus, I am free. I, I am free. In Jesus, in Jesus, I am free. I am free. Stephen, could you play that last song for us? How great the chasm that lay between us how high the mountain I could not climb In desperation I turned to heaven And spoke your name into the night Then through the darkness Your loving kindness Tore through the shadows of is finished the end is written Jesus Christ my living hope who 
could imagine so great a mercy what heart could fathom such boundless grace the god of ages stepped down from glory to wear my sin and bear my shame the cross has spoken i am forgiven the king of kings calls me his own beautiful savior i'm yours forever jesus christ my living hope So thank you for joining us, particularly those who are part of us through Facebook Live. We're going to be signing off our connection with you. Uh, we have a time right now as a church family that we gather and pray for each other's needs. Um, and so we just want to thank you who joined us uh, on Facebook Live uh, before we open this up uh, more to our congregation as a whole. So God bless you, Facebook Live. Uh, if you have any questions, you want to talk to someone, please get a hold of us here at the church. And one of us would be pleased to be able to talk to you about uh, what you've heard this morning. Thank you. <laughs>